My name is Ree Herman, and my debut novel, Love Bites, is being published in July by Joe Fletcher Books. Love Bites is a queer supernatural romance and urban fantasy, and as such, it falls at the confluence of a lot of different subgenres. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to read a bit of the book, and then I'm going to talk about some of my favorite books from the various genres it could be said to fall into, which have either influenced my writing or which I simply just love. This is the book. And let's get started. Vampires. No one believes in them, but everyone's an expert on the subject. After all, they're everywhere, in books, in films, on TV, so most people think they have a pretty good handle on what vampires are all about. But there's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of gaps in what everybody knows. Fictional representation cannot be assumed to be accurate. Let's take television, for example. Nearly every vampire you see on TV is the classic European Dracula type. Think about it. When was the last time you saw an Asian hopping vampire or an African Mumiani on a show? It's like they don't even exist. Do they exist? I have no idea. But it bothers me that everyone assumes they don't. The most basic facts are completely unknown. How many vampires are there in total? How would we find out? It's not like the Census Bureau has a vampire category, and without one, there's no way to tell the difference between a town with vampires and a town where people just happen to bite each other a lot. Anyway, all of this means that most people know far less about vampires than they think they do. And while I've only learned a tiny bit more so far, there are a few matters I can shed light on. So I'd like to start by dispelling some common vampire myths that I've found, from personal experience, are more falsehood than fact. Myth number one. Everyone a vampire bites either becomes a vampire or dies. I suspect this one does more damage to the reputation of vampires than anything else, and like many myths, it may have a basis in reality. I have reason to believe that if someone is exposed to enough vampire bites, then eventually one or both of these things will happen. But the key word here is eventually. Just do the math. Say you start with a single vampire, and that vampire only absolutely has to bite someone once a month. And bear in mind, that's a, conser a conservative estimate already, although it's within the bounds of possibility, as I've learned early on. Let's say that half of the victims become vampires and half of them die. In that case, in two months, you'd have two vampires, and in four months, you'd have four, and everyone on Earth would become a vampire in less than three years. That's right, 34 months after the first bite, there would be more vampires than the entire current world population. Humans would be gone. There'd be nothing but packs of starving predators and no one left to bite except each other. In fact, turning people into vampires seems to be a long and difficult process, which is why you're not surrounded by vampires right now. Although it's possible you're surrounded by werewolves, I wouldn't know. You might ask, what if far more than half of the victims die? That's a way the math could work. But then, why aren't all the morgues full of bloodless cadavers with neck hickeys? Death by biting has to be a relatively rare occurrence, or every vampire would create a substantial trail of very conspicuous corpses. That many vampire-related homicides would be impossible to ignore. You'd be reading about it in the news all the time. There's only one logical conclusion. You can be bitten by a vampire at least once and survive the experience. I'm not saying biting people and drinking their blood isn't a problem. I'm not even saying it isn't evil. But it doesn't have to be murder. Not if you're very, very careful. That's the truth. It has to be the truth. Because some nights, it's the only thing I have. So, as I said, uh, this book falls into a number of genres, and one of them is queer science fiction and fantasy. And one of my favorite books of all time in that genre is Slow River by Nicola Griffith. This is actually a science fiction book, um, unlike most of the books I've chosen, which are fantasy books because I've written a fantasy novel, but this is simply a fabulous book. Um, the writing, the depths of theme are astonishing, and it is probably the best book about sewer treatment that I have ever read. Similarly, to queer SFF, 
this is Queer Fantasy Romance. This is Broken Wings by L.J. Baker. Um, it's similar to the last one, but one is science fiction, one is fantasy, and this is explicitly a romance where the other is not. And one of the reasons I've selected this one, other than that it's an absolutely fabulous book, is that this is a small press book. Uh, now, for many years, small press was the only place you were going to find queer science fiction and fantasy with a few very rare exceptions, Slow River being one of them. Often uh, looking for science fiction or fantasy with queer characters was like diving into the ocean and trying to find one specific fish. Now that has changed a lot in about the past five years, and there have been a lot more mainstream presses uh, putting out queer science fiction and fantasy, but before they did, just about the only place you could reliably find it was from small presses that specialized in it. And this book is an example of one that came from one of those. And those small presses are still doing that and still putting out um, a lot of, of this kind of work, some of which is really fantastic. Uh, this one is about um, a lesbian fairy and her romance and her dealings with society and homophobia within that um, milieu. And it's simply extremely well written, the romance is lovely, and um, I just, I found this by accident one day, just browsing through a bookstore, there it was, um, and fell in love with this book. Moving on to a different genre, urban fantasy, which is fantasy which is set in the real world except with magical elements introduced is a huge influence on my book. And one of my favorite authors of that is Charles DeLint, especially his short fiction. Uh, this is Dreams Underfoot, which contains a number of his stories set in the imaginary city of Newford. One thing I love about Charles DeLint is his use of magic and how it works within his stories. Um, a lot of modern fantasy, the magic works according to a very clear system. It has very clear rules. And I love stories like that. I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons and I adore it when things make sense. But there's also something I love about what I might call the numinous. Magic which can't exactly be explained and can't exactly be pinned down, which does something that doesn't make sense or have logical coherence, that is unnatural, supernatural, and not constrained by reality. And that is something Charles DeLint does astonishingly well, as well as being um, a beautiful writer in terms of uh, his literary style and his prose. Paranormal romance uh, is a genre which shares most of its DNA with urban fantasy. If you were going to describe it, it would still be fantasy set in the real world with magical elements. The difference would be that for paranormal romance, a romance element, the romantic story, is the key point of the plot. Whereas in urban fantasy, it is not the most important element of the plot. Uh, Succubus Blues by Rochelle Mead is the start of a series which um, sits on the border of those two, but I would say ultimately the romance is the most important part of the series, so I would term this paranormal romance. And um, this series is just fun. Uh, it's about a succubus who is uh, forced to go around seducing people for the forces of hell, but eventually falls in love and is trying to get out of it. And it's just, it's the humor, it's sharp, it's witty, uh, the main character is great, um, highly recommend it. The final book I'm going to talk about um, is of a genre which should be obvious from what my reading was, um, vampire novels. And the one I've picked is Sunshine by Robin McKinley, because in my opinion, this is the best vampire novel in the world. And I know there's a lot of contenders for that, but this is the one I love. And I think it is a vampire novel for people who don't normally like vampire novels, because it is simply such a good book. And of course, people who love vampire novels will also love it. But uh, one thing I would find to admire about this is the world building is astonishing. There's so many subtle little things that are just slipped into the story, almost below the level of your notice, 
to build the world and what's going on and the characters. And the main character is a strong and charming uh, person. Uh, it's told from first person point of view, uh, which and um, her perspective just sucks you into the story. Those are the books I wanted to talk about. And once again, my book is Love Bites. And thank you very much.